Universidade de Engenharia Informática que vão decorrer esta quinta, esta quinta e sexta-feira e a Semana da Lei de 12 a 17 de Março. Passa a dar a palavra. Uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Mr. Richard Stallman. Among many other invaluable contributions to the universe of informatics and computer science, Richard Stallman started the free software movement in 1983 and began the development of the GNU project in the following year. It made history on many levels, not least of which is the fact that it pioneered the concept of free software. GNU is free not only to use, but also to copy and redistribute with or without changes. The GNU Linux system, which results from the addition of the Linux kernel to the GNU, is utilized on tens of millions of computers today. Mr. Solomon has received, throughout his career, a series of awards and honors. Some of the most important include the ACM Grace Hopper Award, the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the Electronic Frontier Foundation's Pioneer Award, and the Takeda Award. The subject of today's talk, copyright, and all that it entails, has been an area to which Mr. Stallman has dedicated a huge amount of work and concern throughout his career, which makes his point of view and ideas absolutely priceless, not only to software developers, but to every person who uses copyrighted software, or copyrighted anything else for that matter. Um, I'm going to pass the microphone over to the Proctor of the University, who also has a few words. Uh, uh, 
department departments, uh, students, they uh, also uh, start to uh, even doing the course to uh, work in the research projects. And uh, for example, the student Mario Martins uh, has been awarded with the best student paper in the, in the computer support educative work uh, conference in Shanghai. And uh, last year, Nuno uh, Constantino, a PhD student from the uh, doctoral program in Math E, right? And I'm Paulo Zvil from the Informatic Department. Also, we uh, have a nice paper award in the International Conference on uh, the Data Mining in Arizona. So, I will thanks uh, to the Richard's program to come here. Share with us his vision for the, the treatment of using the internet and other softwares, the free software and the copyright issues. And I believe that it will be very interesting to do this. Thank you. take photos of me, please do not post them in Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is not your friend. Facebook is a surveillance engine. And in particular, when photos are posted there, Facebook collects information about the people appearing in those photos in order to set up its database of information about people. Well, I don't want information about my whereabouts to be in Facebook's database. So please don't post photos of me in Facebook. And I suggest that you not post any photos of your friends in Facebook either. And ask your friends to do likewise if they're real friends as opposed to Facebook friends. Then they will be concerned for your privacy rights. Second. If you make a recording, audio or video, and you want to distribute copies, please distribute them only in formats that are favorable to free software. Those include the OGG formats, that is the AUG formats, and WebEx. So don't distribute in MP3 or MPEG anything, and uh, certainly not if it's going to use Flash. <laughs> and also, on the recordings, please place the Creative Commons No Derivatives license, because this is a statement of my personal views. <clears throat> the reason people started asking me to speak was about free software, the free software movement. <coughs> and free here means leave it. It refers to freedom, not price. Uh, this is not a speech about free software. This speech responds to a question people sometimes ask me at the end of a speech about free software. So in order to make it make sense, I better say a little bit about free software as an introduction. By the way, it's starting to get hot in here. <laughs> uh, and it's going, it would get a lot worse if nothing is done about it. Is there any ventilation system that can be turned on so that we get air in here? <laughs> Who's in charge of this? <laughs> I can't hear you at all. There's nothing we can do. <laughs> There's got to be something we can do. <laughs> if 
if nothing else, we can get some fans and prop the outside doors open and blow air through. <laughs> that would be better than nothing. I would expect a room like this to have some kind of ventilation system. Good. So, so to introduce free software. Free software means software that respects your freedom and community. So, it's free as in freedom. This is not an issue of price. I, so, to understand free software, think of free speech, not free beer. <laughs> And, uh, of course, it will be clearer if you say it in Portuguese because you have a word that means free as in freedom and does not refer to price. So, always use the clearest word available. Uh, don't say free if you're in the middle of a conversation in Portuguese. <clears throat> if a program is not free, then we call it proprietary software, non-free software, user-subjugating software. Because a non-free program generates a system of unjust power. With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program, or the program controls the users. When the users control the program, that's free software, because in order to have effective control of the program, the users need certain freedoms. But if they don't have the necessary freedoms, so they don't have effective control of the program, then it's the program that controls the users. And there's always somebody who controls the program, <coughs> typically the developer. Well, that means through this program, the developer subjugates the users. This is where this is why a non-free program is a system of unjust power. <clears throat> and therefore, non-free software should not exist. <clears throat> but let me be more specific. What are the freedoms users need to have control of the program? There are four essential freedoms and they are the criterion for free software. Freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and change it so the program does your computing as you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help others. That's the freedom to redistribute exact copies to others when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions to others when you wish. Thus, if a program comes with these four freedoms, it's free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical one, one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these freedoms is insufficient, then the program is proprietary because it imposes an unjust social system on its users. In order for these freedoms to be adequate, they must apply to all activities in life, including business. But None of these things is required. You should be free to do these things, but you're not required to do them. It's up to you. Thus, with freedom zero, you're free to run the program as you wish, but it's not required. If you are a masochist, you can run it as you don't wish. And you're also free not to run it. With freedom one, you can study and change the source code, but this is not required. You can receive a copy and run it without looking at anything. With Freedom 2, you can redistribute exact copies, but it's not required. You're not ordered to make copies for people and distribute them. You may feel sometimes that it's the right thing to do. That's a different matter. What we say is you must be free to do this when you choose to do it. And with Freedom 3, if you've made a modified version, you can copy it and distribute copies, 
but it's not required. You could do this if you wish. You could also use the modified version privately. Thus, the distinction between free and proprietary software is not a technical distinction. This is not a technical question at all, although it's a question about the use of technology. It's not about what features the program has. It's not about how the code works. It's not about how the code was written either. This is not a technical question. This is an ethical, social, and political question about the use of technology. And that's why it's so important. We can leave the technical issues of a technical project to the technical people who are doing it. But these ethical issues affect every user. The use of a free program in society is development. Because that program embodies knowledge and if the program is free, that knowledge is available to the users to understand, to maintain, adapt, and extend, and then to apply in other ways. But the use of a proprietary program is not development. It's dependence. Dependence on a particular entity. And that is a social problem. We should aim to eliminate the use of proprietary software from society. To write a free program is a contribution to society. How much? That depends on the details. But at least if it's free software, it's distributed in a way that permits it to contribute whatever it has to offer. But to write a proprietary program is no contribution because it's a power grab. It's an attempt to subjugate people. If this in, in social terms, the program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait. Their purpose is to attract users to fall into the trap. So, paradoxically, they don't make it better. Instead, they make it more harmful. So if you have the choice to write a proprietary program or do nothing at all, you should do nothing at all, because that way you don't do harm. Of course, in real life, you would probably have other choices which are better than both of these. But if these were the only two choices, you should do nothing. Thus, the goal of the free software movement is all software should be free so that all users of software can be free. Now, users of non-free software are, in most cases, the victims of malicious features. It's not just that they can't change the program if the developer didn't anticipate their wishes. It's that the developer deliberately tried to hurt them, deliberately disregarded their wishes with contempt. Malicious features include features to spy on the user, features to restrict the user. Typically, they restrict what users can do with the data in their own computers. And these are called digital handcuffs. And there are also back doors that, can mis that receive commands and can mistreat the user. These are not a rare danger. These are the usual case in proprietary software. Most people who are using proprietary software are using malicious proprietary software. Let me prove this just by enumerating examples. One proprietary package that has all three kinds of malicious features that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. <laughs> and I'm not talking about speculation here. These are specific, known, malicious features of all three kinds. So Windows is malware. Moreover, 
one back door known in Windows gives Microsoft the power to remotely install software changes, any changes, without asking permission of the nominal owner of that computer. Which means that Windows is universal malware. Any malicious feature that is not present in Windows today could be remotely installed tomorrow. Windows is malware, but it's not the only such package. MacOS is malware. It has digital handcuffs. The newer Apple products, the iThings, <laughs> are much worse. They have all three of these kinds of malicious features. In fact, Apple pioneered the nastiest digital handcuffs ever because Apple took control even over the installation of applications. So Apple computer products are malware. Flash Player is malware. It has a known surveillance feature and digital handcuffs. The PlayStation 3 is malware. It was designed with digital handcuffs, and when people figured out a way to break some of them, <clears throat> Sony sent the police after them. That's why we call a total boycott of Sony. Don't buy any Sony products. <clears throat> then there is the Amazon Swindle. That's not its official name. <clears throat> the Amazon Swindle is an e-reader which swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to <clears throat> acquire a book anonymously, perhaps by buying it with cash. And then there's the then there's the freedom to uh, give a book to someone else, or lend it to people, or even to sell it, perhaps to a used bookstore. The swindle eliminates these with digital handcuffs and end-user license agreements. Amazon displays contempt for private property because it says that readers can't own a book. All the books belong to Amazon. And then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish. And uh, someday pass it on to your heirs. Amazon eliminated this with a backdoor. We know about the backdoor by observation. In 2009, Amazon remotely deleted thousands of copies of a particular book. They were authorized copies until that day. They had been obtained directly from Amazon, and therefore Amazon knew exactly where they were, knew exactly which machines to order to delete them. And you know which book it was that demonstrated the Orwellian nature of this product. It was 1984 by George Orwell. <laughs> then there was a lot of criticism, so Amazon promised that it would never do this again unless ordered to by the state which is not very comforting if you think about 1984. Among the least of the crimes, the first of them, you might say, was destroying books. The, of that regime in that book, 1984, was destroying books it didn't like. So, So the official name of that product is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire. So apparently that's a hint at the real purpose of the product, which is to burn our books. 
Well, I've just, oh, by the way, and most portable telephones have a surveillance feature that they will send the phone's location. And they have a back door that can be used to remotely convert them into listening devices. You've heard of software that has bugs. Well, here's software that is a bug. <laughs> so, <clears throat> this, I've now listed the proprietary programs that are used by most users of proprietary software. So, most users of proprietary software are using proprietary malware. And the only known defense against malicious features in software is free software. Because the, when the users of the program have control, they defend themselves and they defend each other. If you don't know how to program, but the program you're using is free, there are other users, and some of them are programmers, and some of them read the source code of that program for various reasons, such as they're thinking of adding features to it. And in the process, they have a chance to discover errors or malicious features. And of course, if they see such a thing, they will fix it. And you will get the benefit of the fix. In protecting themselves, they protect their whole community, including you. This is the only known defense against malware designed as malware by the developer. And when you look at how common those malicious features are, you see that we need to defend ourselves. So, if this were a speech about free software, I would go on and say more about the reasons why each of these freedoms is necessary and the history of the movement. Suffice it to say that I launched the movement in 1983, and in January 84, I started the development of the free software operating system, GNU, GNU, which most users mistakenly call Linux. Uh, please avoid that mistake. Uh, Linux is one component of the system as we use it today. And if you want to give Mr. Torvalds a part of the credit, by all means, call it GNU plus Linux. But please don't leave us out. The GNU project started uh, over eight years before he released any free software. And he didn't start its development. Uh, when, he, when, when I started the development of GNU, Torvalds was uh, in junior high school. <laughs> So, <clears throat> I, sh I guess I should also mention the difference between free software and open source. Because today someone made a remark about my work and called it open source. This confusion is very common. I've explained to you the philosophy of free software briefly. Open source was a term coined in 1998 by people in the free software community who disagreed with our ethical approach to the issue. We regard proprietary software as an injustice, and we want to eliminate this injustice. We want all software users to be free. Well, those people didn't agree with that. They were in the free software community. Some of them were developers of free software, but they chose not to raise an ethical issue. So in 1998, they invented a different term so that they would not have to say free. And the term they invented was open source. With that term, they were able to uh, present a completely different philosophy which did not present it as an ethical issue. So they didn't say that non-open source software is an injustice. They just said they didn't like it and that they thought it probably wouldn't work as well. So these two philosophies are based on different kinds of values. 
They're different at the deepest level. <clears throat> and because there are so many open source supporters, they have given people the impression that I'm one of them. And that's what really bothers me. See, they have a right to their views. They have a right to state their views. But it's not right for them to imply that I agree with them. I don't. I'm a free software supporter. So please keep in mind that I have never intentionally done anything for open source. I'm a supporter of the free software movement. And I hope you will think about these issues, and I hope you'll choose to support the free software movement also. So now on to the question that this talk is about. In the 90s, when I gave talks about free software, people would sometimes ask at the end, do the same ideas apply to other things? Like what about hardware? Should hardware be free too? Well, uh, if we're talking about the same definition of free, it's not possible for computer hardware. It's, it's a, not even a meaningful question for computer hardware. <coughs> like the freedom to study and change it. Well, you can't change a chip. No one can. And that's not anybody's fault. That's not the result of, of any malice. It's just that the nature of chips is there's no way to change them once they're made. And likewise, there are no copiers for chips. It just isn't part of, it isn't feasible technology, not today at least. So the question of whether you're free to copy and, and distribute chips is meaningless. And, and since you can't modify a chip, Freedom 3 is also meaningless too. You'll never have a modified version of a chip that does anything. So we don't need to talk about what you'd be free to do if you had one. So basically, these questions are meaningless for computer hardware, except Freedom Zero. You can have Freedom Zero. But still, asking whether computer hardware is free is not a meaningful question today. But there are other things for which this question is meaningful. For instance, other kinds of published works of authorship be other than software. Well, if you could have a copy of a work in your computer, then with your computer you can copy it and you can change it. So the question of whether you're allowed to do so, whether you're free to do so, is a meaningful question with real consequences. And that's the question I'm speaking about. For the most part, if you have a copy of a work that is not software, the only thing that would restrict what you can do with it is copyright law. <coughs> now, uh, book distributors such as Amazon are trying to change that, but that's still a new, uh, a new practice. For the most part, copyright law is what decides what you can do with your copies. So we can ask the same question from the other side by saying, what should copyright law say? When we consider issues of copyright law, it's interesting to look at the history of copyright law, which is closely connected with the history of copying technology. Now, changes in technology don't alter basic moral principles, because those are too deep to be touched by superficial things like technology. But when we apply our principles to a specific question, we do it by looking at the consequences of the various possible options. Well, a change in the context can alter the consequences of a particular action and make it more good or more bad than it was before. For instance, if we could reliably resurrect the dead, then murder wouldn't be so bad. The judge would say, you are sentenced to pay for his new body. 
Now, in the U.S., we would all need to have uninsured murderer insurance. <laughs> but in civilized countries, the National Health Service would take care of it. <laughs> so, Let's look at the history of copying technology and copyright. Copying began in the ancient world, where you read one copy and you wrote another copy. This technology was very slow, but it had certain other interesting characteristics. First of all, it had no economy of scale. To make 10 copies would take you 10 times as long as making one copy. Second, it required no special skill other than the skill of reading and writing. And third, it required no special equipment other than the equipment for reading and writing. The result was decentralized production of copies. Wherever there was one copy and someone wanted to make another, he could do so. There was nothing like copyright in the ancient world, never. <clears throat> if you had a copy and wanted to make another, nobody tried to stop you. Nobody said you were not allowed to do so. Except in the case where the local potentate didn't like that book. In which case, he might do horrible things to you. Which was, however, not copyright, but rather censorship. Copyright and censorship have been closely related through history. But in the ancient world, there was only censorship, no copyright. <coughs> then there was a big advance in copying technology, the printing press, which made copying more efficient, but in a non-uniform way. Here's the situation in the age of the printing press. Mass production and one-off copying both equally slow. With the printing press, we got this. Mass production copying became much more efficient, but one-off copying did not benefit at all because the fastest way to do that was to write the copy by hand. You see, the printing press had an economy of scale. It took a long time to set the type, but once that was done, you could very quickly make many identical pages. In addition, the printing press and the type were expensive equipment that most literate people did not own. And they also didn't know how to use them because running a press is a different skill from reading and writing. Most literate people did not know how to use a printing press. <clears throat> The result was a centralized system of producing copies. Copies of a given book were made in a few places, and then they were transported to where someone might want to buy them. <clears throat> Copyright began in the age of the printing press. And it operated as a, a regulation on publishing. Copyright in England, which I think is more or less the ancestor of copyright today everywhere, began in the 1500s as a system of censorship, explicitly so. In order to be allowed to publish a book, one had to ask the state for permission, and the permission was granted as a theoretically perpetual monopoly for one publisher. However, this system of censorship was allowed to lapse in the late 1600s. Then the publishers clamored to get their monopoly back. But what they actually got was somewhat different. What was established then was a system where the copyright would belong to the author for, I believe, 14 years, but it could be renewed once. 
if the author was alive. And the idea developed that copyright's purpose was to promote writing. When the U.S. Constitution was written, there was a suggestion that it should say that authors were entitled to a copyright. This was rejected. Instead, it said that Congress has the power to establish a copyright system, but isn't required to do so. So nobody has a constitutional right to a copyright in the U.S. It's a, it's a system that was established as a choice. Uh, the Constitution also says that copyright has to last for a limited time, and that its purpose is to promote progress. In other words, the reason for copyright is not to give authors something they deserve, but rather to benefit the public, because progress is a benefit for the public.
with digital technology, it's now feasible for all of us to copy. As an, as an illustration of this, mass-produced CDs are somewhat cheaper and somewhat more robust than one-off CDs. But one-off CDs are cheap enough that hundreds of millions of people around the world can make them. So we now can all copy. And as a result, even if copyright law had not changed, its effect would be totally different because they now try to apply it to all the readers. So in the age of the computer networks, copyright has become a restriction on the general public controlled mainly by the publishers with trickle down to the authors so that they can say they're doing it in the name of the authors. As a result, it's no longer uncontroversial. In fact, now people start political parties to fight against the tyrannical effect of copyright law. It's no longer easy to enforce. In fact, many countries are trying to invade everyone's internet connection specifically to enforce copyright. And it's no longer beneficial because the freedom that we traded away, or that the state actually traded away on our behalf, but we didn't mind because we couldn't exercise that freedom in the age of the printing press, we now can exercise, and we want to exercise, we want to be able to copy. Therefore, what would a democratic government do? It would reduce copyright power. It would give us the freedom to copy. This doesn't necessarily mean eliminating copyright law, but means reducing the power that it exercises. We can measure the lack of democracy in governments around the world by their tendency to do the exact opposite. They're making copyright more strict and more powerful, showing that they're not working for their citizens. These governments have betrayed their countries to mega corporations. Let's look at what they are doing. They are extending copyright power in various ways. One way is in the duration of copyright. Copyright lasts a ridiculously long time. 70 years after the author's death. Well, that's, that's crazy. Oh, wait, no, it was, yeah. And so uh, that can last more than a century easily. Works that were written before you were born, you'll never see them in the public domain. But nonetheless, there's a worldwide push to make it longer. In 1998, the U.S. extended copyright by 20 years on both past and future works. And one of the stated reasons was harmonization with Europe. In the U.S., it was 50 years after the author's death, which could have lasted more than a century anyway, but no, that wasn't long enough. So they extended copyright for both past and future works. How can they promote progress by extending copyright on past works? The only way they could convince the now dead authors and artists of the 1920s and 30s to, to work more is if they have a time machine. And apparently they forgot to use it because our history books don't record that when the artists and authors were informed about how their copyrights would be extended, that they set to work with renewed vigor. Why don't they use their time machine? Get us some more beloved classics. Now, theoretically, extending copyright on future works could increase the purely economic motivation to make those works. But 
that wouldn't have an effect on anybody <coughs> rational because the discounted present value of 20 more years of copyright starting 50 years after you're going to die is so small that it won't influence any rational decision. The real reason that they extended copyrights was because some companies had lucrative monopolies which were scheduled to end. For instance, Mickey Mouse. The early movies with Mickey Mouse in them were going to go into the public domain soon. And since Disney has obtained a lot from the public domain, it knows how important that is and is determined never to contribute anything back. So Disney lobbied for, which in the US means effectively paid for this law, to extend the monopoly on Mickey Mouse by 20 more years. Of course, in 2018, they will be back in the same situation, so they'll probably try to extend it again. Now, they said that this law was to harmonize with Europe. However, for works made by employees of a company, Europe and the US had the same copyright duration. It was uh, 75 years. So this law extended it in the US to 95 years. I expect that sooner or later Europe is going to extend it by 20 years to, to, harmonize, to harmonize with the US. So basically there are these two things like this and each one can say we've got to extend it to harmonize. And they could ratchet it up like that ad infinitum. And there has been just recently an extension of the length of copyright for uh, sound recordings in Europe. I believe that was actually approved, which is another step in the wrong direction. <laughs> So, uh, the worst case I know of is in Mexico, where copyright lasts until 100 years after the author's death. So in Mexico, something was, if something was written by a person who died before you were born, you might never see it in the public domain. And this is insane. At least it's insane if you think that copyright is supposed to serve some public purpose. The other dimension that they extend is the breadth of copyright. Which uses of a copyrighted work are restricted? Well, in the age of the printing press, copyright was not supposed to cover everything you might do with a copyrighted work. There were certain uses, uses that were restricted by copyright, but those were the exceptions. And then everything else you were still free to do. But the publishers have recognized that digital technology gives them the opportunity to seize total control over our use of copyrighted published works. They want to impose a pay-per-view universe. And the way they do it is with digital handcuffs, by turning our technology against us. Digital handcuffs are always implemented in proprietary software. And the reason is to build digital handcuffs in free software would be like making physical handcuffs out of strips of paper. And you, they wouldn't hold you or making them out of modeling clay. You could just move your hands apart. The clay would stretch and break. That wouldn't be effective to restrict us and shackle us because with free software, the users have control. And they want to have <coughs> control over us, which means they have to use that only non-free software suits their purpose. 
As a result, these digital handcuffs attack our freedom in two ways at once. First of all, they're implemented in proprietary software. They publish these works in secret formats, and the only player programs that exist are proprietary. That's, what, that's the reason why you're compelled to use proprietary software, but every proprietary program is an attack on users' freedom. So there you, that, that's one attack on your freedom. But then the digital handcuffs themselves are an attack on your freedom. That's the whole point of them, is to take away your freedom, to, to restrict your use of those published works in ways that the copyright law itself wouldn't do. So they're trying to take more power than copyright law itself actually gives them. And to do so by making the technology we use restrict us. So, <clears throat> the first place the public saw DRM, Digital Restrictions Management, was in DVDs, because the video on DVD can be encrypted specifically for the purpose of restricting users. And that encryption format was initially secret, so that people would be unable to make other ways of playing the DVD. And that scheme worked for a while to restrict people, but then uh, a few people figured out the format and published a free program that could actually play the video on a DVD. The movie companies didn't like this. So they got a law, first in the US, but later in the European Union, which censors such software. So the European Union, as well as the US, have imposed censorship of software. And that free software is forbidden to distribute in most EU countries. But there is one example, but one exception I know of. In Finland, a court ruled that the, the law forbidding such software didn't apply to that program because that program was so widely available that the DVD encryption system was no longer an effective scheme to restrict people. Well, that's a, I like that decision. I hope that they make similar decisions for everything else, but we can't count on that, and it doesn't excuse the evil of banning software we can use to break digital handcuffs. Now, despite this, this, these laws, that software is easy to find. So, uh, the movie companies developed another scheme of DRM which they call AACS. And that's what's one of the levels of digital handcuffs used in Blu-ray discs. Blu-ray discs have another level of digital handcuffs, which they change every few months. So nobody has ever succeeded in making free software that can play all Blu-ray discs. So they're still at it. And it would be a mistake to assume that we will always defeat them technically. We have to defeat them politically. We have to get rid of those laws. Okay. You don't have to whisper. I can hear you better if you speak louder, but yes, do it. Uh, did they run out before? Okay. Did, did you miss anything? No, no, I don't. Yes. Yeah.